Okay. So my name is Roger Roshnik. I work for PSI Audio in Switzerland. PSI Audio has been making uh, loudspeakers and uh, studio monitors for 40 years. We've been making active monitors for 25 years uh, that we developed for a brand called Studer and we made for them for Studer and since since about 10, 12 years, we've, been, we've relaunched our own brand and making them ourselves. But the, our only mission is to transform an electric signal into an acoustic signal, and this as accurately as possible in frequency and in phase. So we've developed analog technology that allows to go a lot faster than digital technology for where it works, to align the phase and keep the frequency flat in the response. So we manufacture these uh, speakers and monitors by hand still in Switzerland, and then we test them individually in our anechoic chamber to make sure that every single piece that leaves the factory is absolutely perfect. And we feel very happy and proud of that. And then we put this in the room and realize that the speaker is only half the story. The other half is the room and how the room responds to the speaker. Uh, because, as you know, there's always echo in a room, and uh, unfortunately, these echoes are very different in different frequencies. So this is what we tried to... Uh, we tried to develop a system with our active technology to try and do a system that will absorb and clean the room as much as possible. We first... Um, worked with the University in Geneva 20 years ago and developed or did a, a diploma work that proved the theory that it worked. And three years ago, we managed to convince the Swiss government that it was an innovation that had a commercial prospect, and they granted some money to the EPFL, that's the Polytechnical School in Lausanne, as well as the University in Geneva, to work with us to develop a commercial product and to see if it was viable. Uh, since then, we have two patents, one in the digital world and one in the analog world, which has given birth to also a product that's been on the market for the last six months or five months. So I'll just go through uh, very quickly how it works. Um, and what this is. Um, so you all know how echoes work. Basically, way, uh, sound goes from a wall onto the next, and if the wavelength is correct, it'll go from one wall to the next and be exactly in phase with the one coming back, and it'll reinforce the wave. And this can happen left, right, back to forth, up and down, diagonally across a wall or diagonally through the volume of the room. Um, these are, of course, very annoying because they tend to reinforce some frequencies that we don't have in the others. And this means that the whole response of the room will be wrong. Um, just one thing here, I'm not going to go into details, but one thing you should remember is that there's always a correlation. If you have what we, we reason in terms of pressure all the time, because that's what we hear, that's what we measure, that's what we try and reproduce. So pressure is pressure going up and down in the air. Like in weather forecast, when you have high pressure, low pressure, you have wind going one way or the other. So here the same, you have molecules of air going very slightly back and forth. This is what we call the acoustic velocity of air. And this is what we try and control, the velocity of the air to try and control the pressure in these frequencies. Um, what you should realize is that uh, energy conservation dictates that when the pressure goes up, the velocity goes down and vice versa. So they're in opposite phase. But they always have to be, the energy is the same. So when a, when a uh, pressure wave comes against a wall that is rigid, the speed is zero. De facto, by definition, that means the pressure will be as, at its peak, highest, and it will create the wave to go back. Um, just an illustration here of one position of uh, different waves coming back and forth that can create peaks if it's an addition and then nulls where there's none. And this is very disturbing when you want to hear an accurate sound. Yeah? Um, there's different ways of dealing with this. Okay? Here we've represented the different ways of dealing with room modes. Uh, on the left-hand side, there's the recording room where you record instruments, acoustic instruments here. And then there's the reproduction room where you're going to listen to the speakers. So the first example here is the EQ. Oops. So here, EQ. So in the recording room, you, get a, you can basically filter out the frequencies that are disturbing in the place where you're listening so that you don't hear them. And you can do exactly the same in the listening room. Um, no, sorry, the, uh, EQ, yeah. And you can do exactly the same in the listening room. The problem with this is that it has to be set up properly, and then it only works in one single position. If you move, it doesn't work anymore. You have the bass traps. That's basically a passive system uh, that will absorb quite efficiently a certain, certain amount of energy. And this works in the recording room and the reproduction room. Um, 
The problem uh, with this is it tends to be either broadband and absolutely enormous, or it's very small uh, bandwidth and it's a lot smaller. Uh, it's also fixed, it has to be tuned to the room and all the rest. Noise cancelling. Um, of course, if you're listening here, you've got a frequency disturbing coming from here, you can send in another, the same frequency in the opposite phase so that it annuls the frequency here. So that works quite well. If you've got a single frequency, you set it up properly, you don't move anything, it works quite well. And then what we try and do is we try and have the same process or the same effect of passive absorber, but a lot more efficient. Uh, so what we should try and, and what we try and do is remove the wall and get away the, take away the wall because that's the disturbing, that's where the echo comes from. It might be disturbing here, but it comes from the walls, and that's what you have to try and get rid of. So we like to call our the AVA system, that AVA is acoustic velocity uh, active absorber, we try and call it an anti-wall because that's the effect it has. How does it work? <coughs> well, of course you have a microphone that measures the pressure that comes there. And then what it tries to do is compensate. So there's a little grid in front, so there's a grill with very small perforations. And this will not let the pressure pass, but it would let the air through. Behind that, you have what we call the silent chamber, where we try and keep zero pressure. So what you should imagine, if you have a bucket full of water, at the bottom of the bucket full of water, you have pressure inside, but no velocity. If you punch a hole in it, or a few holes, the water will come out, with velocity, with speed, but no more pressure. This is what we try and do with this grill, is that one side there's pressure and the other side there's velocity. And this velocity, so you have air going in and out through these little slots, and we try and compensate that with a membrane going back and forth. Behind that membrane there's a closed chamber where all the rest of the energy is absorbed. So in terms of energy, most of it is absorbed through this acoustic resistance and the rest is absorbed in this chamber. Um, I just want to explain a bit better how it works, but this is, uh, imagine if you have a, a big door that's about two square meters, and when, or a wall two square meters, when a pressure wave comes against it, if it's rigid, it'll go back, the pressure wave, there'll be an echo. So what you can do is move it back and move it forward, so that you're absorbing all the pressure that comes towards you. That's understandable, I guess, and this is what we try and do. Now, instead of having four square meters, we try and do it in something much smaller than this, like this size. So inside here, we also do the same effect, but you have to move much faster. So you're, you're using more speed and less pressure. And you're changing the impedance, the impedance, the acoustic impedance of air, that is the ratio between the acoustic pressure and the acoustic velocity. So in normal air, when it comes here, in front of your door, you have an impedance of about 400 pascals per meter second, pressure divided by speed. And when you come down to here, to have the same effect as these four square meters, you need an impedance here that we achieve around 100. So we're modifying the impedance of, air, of the air, and that's what makes us a lot more efficient than this two or five square meter moving backwards and forwards which, by the way, would be extremely difficult to get it moving at 50 hertz. So that's how it works, basically. So you should imagine it when you turn it on, it'll have the same effect as this door that you move back and forth, or you could say this is just an open window where the pressure just goes straight through. So this has the same effect as a, an open window about one and a half meters radius around it. That means about between uh, 15 and 25 times the size of this object here. So when it, this is illustrated here, where you can see in a corner one of these elements with 100 pascals per, per speed uh, unity, and then a bit further, about a meter, meter and a half, you get up to the 400. And the effect is if you put it in the corner, this is the first, only the first mode uh, of pressure. So this is here we, we're looking at the impedance and here we're looking at the pressure. Not quite the same thing, but you can see the effect that it'll have on the, press, on the pressure. Now, the theory says um, we want to measure how, so, so we simulate this and see what the effect is in a room. Everybody knows Sabin's law and what the equivalent square meters are. And this is what it looks like with one AVA in black, uh, two and four. So 
we can see that there's a there's a proportional it's proportional to the the amount of AVAAs you have, and here we tried it with different rooms going from six square meters to 54 square meters that represent the different modes, and with different uh, absorption coefficients from very low to something quite normal. So we can see that there's a kind of trend here, and we can see that one of these objects has between uh, has an efficiency of about five square meters down to two square meters. That's the theory. Um, then we moved on to the pra into practice and we positioned them into different studios and checked what it was. One studio that was quite fun to test had some, some of these base traps in the corners that we could remove. So that was very good. We could test it with base traps without and then with our element. And what did we find? So this is the studio. So this is a, like a waterfall. Huh? I think you all kind of understand this. So we have here the frequencies from 20 hertz up to 100. And we have here from zero to half a second. So it's already quite a good room huh? with 0.3 uh, seconds of reverb time. Uh, but this is the absorption walls on their own. And you can see that there's some peaks and some nulls that are a bit disturbing. Then we put in the base traps again, and this is what it looks like. And we can see that the base trap that we had had quite a good effect in this area here only, but it had no effect down here. And then we put uh, the AVAAs in, and we see that we can ta we're taking quite a lot of energy out of here. We're also smoothening these dips quite a bit, and we've taken energy out of here. So that's what the practice showed us. Um, out of all this, we tried to develop a graph. Now, you must understand that where you position them in, a, in your room has an enormous importance, because you could put it somewhere against the wall that doesn't contribute to one of the negative frequencies that disturbs you. Where you so there, it'll be totally useless. And there's other places where it's extremely useful, where most of the, the energy and the pressure is highest. So if you position them in places where the pressure is highest, it'll have a lot more effect than in low ones. But this is basically the curve that we came up with, where you find that one of these has uh, up three to four square meters between 15 and, uh, and 100 uh, hertz. Um, and it'll, be de it'll depend on the size of the room, the type of absorption, and, and typically where you put it in the room. What people notice uh, when you turn them on and you put them on is that so you get, you're getting rid of quite a bit of these modal frequencies in your room. And of course, while well, you hear the echo that is a lot shorter in time, and that's the first thing that people notice, is that the, 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 the reverberation time is shortened. But you also find homogeneity in the uh, frequency response, because the peaks have disappeared, or, or at least come down quite a bit, and the nulls has gone up, which makes sense. But the other thing that lots of people have, and there's also in this frequency response, uh, lots of people said, haha, the mids and the higher frequencies are a lot cleaner now because there's a lot less masking effects by the low frequencies. And sometimes you can't even hear the difference in terms of time, but you can hear the, you can hear the tone of the, of the typically voices and instruments a lot better because there's less masking effects by lower frequencies. And the other thing, of course, is, uh, is the, uh, the source of the sound and the location of the sound. If you have more direct sound and less indirect sound, the location of the sound will be a lot more accurate. So lots of uh, sound engineers said, aha, when we turn them on now, yeah, they, you can hear that there's, the bass is cleaner and tighter, but also I can, I can hear that this, the source is a lot more cleaner and comes from this direction, and you can position it in the stereo picture a lot better. Voila. Um, a few limitations, of course. Well, we developed it to go from up to 150 hertz. So basically, there's a high-pass filter somewhere around 15 hertz, but it goes right down to that and up to about 150 hertz. Uh, so it does a very good job there, but it won't turn a squash room into a perfect studio either. That is true. Um, the other problem that we've had is, is how do you measure it? Because we can put it into, into a room and test it and say, right, OK, this one performs like this, measure everything in this room, in this position. But how do you measure it if you want to make a production item and get it? How do you measure it in a laboratory? You can't really measure pressure and the effects, or, or you'd need a standard room and say, right, we'll measure them all in this room. And then you say, what about if you have different dimensions? It's, it's quite difficult. So what we had to develop is a, is a system to measure the change in speeds that it does when it's on and off. So that means you want to measure the speed of these pressure waves down to 20 hertz. That's extremely difficult to do. 
and in different directions and all the rest. So we had to develop also all of the, all the measurement tools to go with it, that is also quite interesting. But the key advantage is, well, of course, uh, it's perfectly stable and there's no settings required. It's broadband. You put it in a corner and turn it on and it works. The idea is it tends to absorb everything that comes to it, but it'll be most efficient there where the, the pressure is higher, and that's the modal uh, frequencies. Uh, absolutely no sound emitted. It's not anti-noise or anything like that. It is absorption. Uh, no al alteration of the direct sound. So your direct sound, what comes out of your speakers or your instrument, has not been changed at all. It's an acoustic solution to, for an, a room and not for the source. Um, it significantly reduces all the modal reverberations, as I said. And you can switch it on and off, you can move it around, uh, you can take it, if you're doing recording somewhere else, you take it with you and uh, it's a movable asset instead of a, a fixed asset. Danke für Ihre Aufmerksamkeit. <laughs> so I've tried to be quick to keep some, uh, a bit of time for answer questions, if anybody has some. One, two, one, two. Um, you, uh, in the picture of the, di um, of the electronic diagram, you there's obviously a microphone employed. Yes. But where did you install it in this, in front of it? It's just behind here. So it's behind the gaze, behind no. the acoustic resistance. No, the first, this is just mechanical protection, protection out oh, in okay. front. And then there's a microphone. And then behind that, there's this uh, micro -perfor perforated sheet. Um, uh, you say it's an absorber, but... Uh, it's uh, electrical. Is there a maximum, um, a maximum amplitude of sound it can absorb? Um, so it's, it's basically, well, that's a design uh, choice. Uh, we've designed it to kind of peak around 118 decibel. That is quite high, but again, in low frequencies, you can, you can get to there quite quickly. So when it peaks at about 118 dB, what happens is it's just working as much as it can, and that's it. And then the equivalent surface probably goes down a little bit, but it's still absorbing, there's nothing wrong with it. But the equivalent surface will go down a little bit. Uh, so if you want to use it in a rock stadium, for instance, you need more? Well, each one of them you put in will be as equ equivalent to about four to five square meters of a window that you open in the room. That's it. Mm. And in a rock stadium, it won't make much effect. You need to open a lot of these windows. But in a studio, uh, it will have quite a lot of effect. We, we recommend having two to, to keep symmetrical uh, characteristics in your listening. Um, just one question with respect to your uh, speaker which you are using. Uh, any speaker normally has some distortions. Um, yes. So this one definitely will also have some. Maybe it's a good one, which I assume. Yes. But still, uh, if it's moving, mm -hmm. it will produce some sound. Mm -hmm. Can you hear it and will it disturb uh, during recording especially? I mean, this is... <coughs> This is exactly, no, you don't hear it. To answer your question briefly, no, you don't hear it. And now, the, the, all, I mean, as I said, for 25 years, we've been trying to get membranes to vibrate with the least distortion possible, as accurately possible in phase and all the rest. But there are, and then there are some, uh, of course, this is what's very, com and why, I mean, the principle is very simple. So how come nobody's managed to achieve something like this before? Because it's very difficult to keep it stable. First of all, we've only really managed to do it with analog technology. That, it's because you have to keep the distance between the microphone here and the membrane as small as possible. That means you have to be as quick as possible, and that you can only achieve with, with analog technology without having to convert it into digital and back again. That's one reason. And then, of course, there's filters in here, and all these filters, there's lots of different filters that will create phase uh, distortion that you have to keep as clean as possible. And that's the secret to, uh, to keeping it stable, is all of this, yes. So the, yes, that's, the, that's the, the tricky bit, is to keep it stable. Make it efficient and unstable is easy. Make it stable and inefficient is very easy also. But to make it efficient and stable is what the, what the, the aim of the game is. 
And, but the speaker we use is just the, the same speaker we use in our monitors because we know it very well and, uh, and uh, yeah, that's so, the obvious. So I'm surprised that nobody is asking for the prize. Isn't that discouraging? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, it's not supposed to be a commercial uh, presentation, <laughs> but you can go and look on internet. I mean, we have the, it's, it's sold by all our representatives and... Uh, okay. But to answer your question, I mean, the idea is it's, a, it, it's approximately 2,000 a piece, mm -hmm. uh, without, depending on, without VAT and stuff. What hints are you giving uh, for its application? So, as you explained, you have to, uh, to find the right spot. Yes. So, sorry, what was your question? What? Well, how do you uh, help to find the right well, spot? Okay, basic, it's very complicated and difficult to measure. But what we find is when you do put them in a studio, it's very easy to get them to work properly. So what we, in most studios, we, we recommend a minimum of two of them to keep it symmetrical. And two of them will have quite a big effect, at least up to 50, 60 square meters that covers most studios. And it depends also the, the result you want to achieve. So most people would start with two, and then if they really want something better, they would go to four. Uh, Bob Katz, for example, he tested them and wrote a review, and he bought three. God knows why, but that was it. Might be all his budget wanted. Um, that's Bob. Yeah, that's Bob. <laughs> and now, positioning them, what we find in most cases, the corners behind the speakers are always effective. But if you want to do it properly, I'll just do this very quickly. If you want to do it properly, you're sitting, you're listening to your music here. So you want to do a, you do a sweep, frequency response here where you're listening, and you can see which frequencies are a problem here. Then what you want to see is where these problematic frequencies come from. So you imagine, okay, let's say you've got 40, 60, and, and uh, 80 hertz. So the 40 hertz, you play a sinus, 40 hertz, and then you just walk around the room on the edge, and you can see it, you can hear it going up and down. And then you put a cross, you say 40 hertz is, is the most pressures here, here, and here. Do the same with 60, it's here, here, and here, 80, here, here, here. And then you can decide, well, I'm going to put it here, because then I'll affect the 40, the 60, and the 80 over there and there. And in about an hour, you can set them up, you can find the best position. Bear in mind also, it doesn't have to be set up like a monitoring system that's to the millimeter, has to be correct. If you move it a little bit and it goes down from 100% from efficiency to 98%, you won't, it won't make a big, big difference. We have demos also this afternoon in the Torn Studio room. Uh, I think there's still some place on there. Lunchtime. <laughs> Mahlzeit. <laughs> <laughs>